Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Denis Podubny. I'm rheumatologist from Berlin, Germany. And today with me, I'm Kai Herman. I'm a radiologist, also from Charité University Hospital in Berlin, Germany. And today we are trying something new. We will present the case number 33 of the Azas online case library together. Dennis, please start. So um, we are presenting a new case, and uh, this is a case of a 68 years old uh, male patient with a history of axial spondylar arthritis already for many years. So the disease has been known, has been diagnosed in the past, um, and was sufficiently controlled over many years by um, um, on-demand intake of NSAIDs, by doing exercises. But recently, in the last two months, patient experienced some new back pain or constant back pain. This back pain had not necessarily uh, all the inflammatory back pain features. You see, uh, back pain occurred um, um, uh, um, at both um, exercise and at rest, had potential for improvement with uh, and worsening with exercise. There was no night pain and morning stiffness was, was not very prominent. Patient took uh, ibuprofen, um, four to 600 milligram per day with substantial improvement of symptoms. There were no uh, peripheral manifestations such as arthritis, enthesitis, or ductilitis. Um, acute anterior uveitis was known as uh, um, uh, extramusculoskeletal manifestation in the last episode occurred uh, two years ago. There was a positive family history. Uh, the patient's daughter is uh, suffering from ankylosing spondylitis, axial spondylarthritis, and has been currently treated with a TNF alpha blocker. So the patient's request was whether um, this new um, therapy could be suitable also for him. At clinical examination, there was a bit of tenderness over the left sacroiliac joint. The sex sign was negative on both sides. Spinal mobility was substantially limited um, in the lumbar spine, where no peripheral uh, manifestations, no obvious um, um, extra uh, uh, musculoskeletal manifestations. Basti, as you see, was uh, quite high with five, and uh, Asdas was um, uh, also uh, high accordingly. In the lab, HLAB27 was known to be positive and CRP at this presentation was rather normal. So in this case, uh, we're dealing with a patient with already known um, axial spondylarthritis or ankylosing spondylitis uh, presenting with new symptoms. Therefore, we thought it, it uh, might be worthwhile to have a look at what is happening in the axial skeleton, whether we're dealing with inflammation or whether we're dealing with uh, problems related rather to mechanical issues. Therefore, um, in this case, we performed MRI um, of sacroiliac joints in the spine to capture both active inflammatory and structural changes. And I'm showing you now um, um, uh, MRI of the sacroiliac joints. What you see here, these are four um, sequences representing the current standard of MRI of sacroiliac joints for the diagnostic purposes if excel spondylarthritis is suspected. You see here a T1 weighted sequence where we see uh, structural changes there. There, there is complete ankylosis of both sacroiliac joints. So the diagnosis of radiographic excel spondylarthritis can be considered as confirmed. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, STIR sequence, we see that in sacroiliac joints, there is no inflammation. Then we have um, a so-called erosion-sensitive sequence, wipe sequence, where we see again ankylosis. And finally, we have um, 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 axial or semi axial STIR, uh, where we can assess inflammation in the posterior um, uh, segments or uh, posterior part of sacroiliac joints very well. And um, here you see we don't have 
uh, active inflammatory changes in the sacroiliac joints. So the next would be the spine that will be presented by uh, Professor Hammond. The spinal MRI was performed um, by uh, three different MRI sequences, uh, uh, T1 and T2 weighted sequences, and in addition, a STIR sequence. And uh, we are now uh, looking at the T1 weighted MRI sequence and uh, Again, here we, uh, we, uh, we, we see confirmation of long-standing disease. There is uh, ankylosis visible, in, uh, in, in especially in, in these two segments. If you, if you look carefully, there is uh, this hyper-intense uh, substance in, in the area where we would expect the nucleus pulposus, which is usually of low signal intensity on a T1-weighted scan. So uh, this is already... Um, ankylosis, and this is a new bone formation in the in the uh, disc itself. So you see, um, it, uh, when you see an increased signal on a T1 weighted scan, you can always expect uh, 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 fatty tissue, and this is usually the case in in repair uh, uh, tissue and, and new bone formation in ankylosis. So also on MRI, uh, ankylosis can be seen. But it is rather um, uh, difficult to to distinguish it because on X-rays you see it uh, uh, right on the spot because you are used to to look at the uh, uh, fused bone segments. But we unfortunately don't have an X-ray here. I will uh, illustrate it a bit more. Uh, these different types of um, uh, of ankylosis, so um, you see, we have uh, we have ankylosis in the anterior aspect of the uh, discs, and we have it in the central part. And in fact, there are two types of uh, uh, new bone formation known in uh, patients with excess bone arthritis. We have the annulus fibrosus type of ossification, which you can see here in the anterior part, and also maybe a little bit in the posterior aspect. But then in 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 rare cases, I have to say, we also have ankylosis through the disc itself. So that means the normal nucleus pulposus is replaced by new bone, as you see it here in these two levels, and also up here in this level, sparing out only uh, only some of the disc. In fact, three discs are having a normal nucleus pulposus. Also on this T1 already, we see some uh, syndesmophytes here. And uh, we can uh, now look at T2 and STIR to see if there's active inflammation. And on the T2-weighted scan, we see here now the fluid is now bright. In order to detect bone marrow edema, it is very difficult on the T2 because we ha also have the bright signal from the fat, uh, fatty repair tissue. So I would recommend uh, using a STIR sequence to analyze the spinal changes. And here on the STIR sequence, there are more or less no inflammatory uh, lesions in these vertebral bodies. There is this roundish lesion here, and um, some of you have, may have already seen it on, on this T1. It's also here to be seen with a little bit of fat inside. So this is um, a typical, uh, a typical uh, example of an hemangioma. The genema joma, which we marked uh, uh, for you. And uh, if you look carefully, you can also see some bone marrow edema here in the upper end plate of the sacral bone, and maybe also a little bit uh, in the lower aspect of the L5 uh, vertebral uh, body. And, um, and, and looking again at the T1 and, and focusing on this, on this lower segment, uh, it, it becomes evident that we see uh, also some osteophytes maybe, especially if we go to the very lateral aspect of the spine, we see these large ossification patterns that might also be, be there on this L4 level. So we have a mixture of, of syndesmophyte uh, formation with, with vertical-oriented <coughs> ossification, and we have also these, these more bulgy uh, uh, ossification patterns, which we call osteophyte, and which we we think are related to degenerative changes. And also, if you look carefully, uh, you can see there is some erosion 
in the end plate <coughs> of this uh, of the second segment. So it is really um, now to be discussed uh, whether this is uh, an Anderson lesion in in axial SPA because we have this erosion and uh, we might have some bony new new bone formation. Uh, but but it it's it's doubtful if this explains the pain or if this is some kind of mechanical uh, complication uh, uh, in this patient. How would you uh, 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 go along with these uh, changes, Dennis? Yeah, um, in, in, indeed, um, um, it, it is a, a point now uh, uh, for for a discussion because it would have a clear. Uh, um, practical and therapeutic relevance for um, this uh, patient uh, if we interpret this as uh, an inflammatory lesion and this bone marrow edema also related to inflammation then we would probably need uh, to escalate the anti-inflammatory therapy but if we think that this is a mechanical issue then um, uh, we we don't have to go up and uh, prescribe cytoki cytokine inhibitors or um, uh, uh, small molecules. So in this case, uh, we, we had a discussion, and uh, finally, what 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 do you see here um, in the, in the upper lumbar spine, there are clear um, post-inflammatory changes. So clear ankylosis of the spine with stiff spine uh, over there. In two lower segments, you have, however, incomplete ankylosis. And uh, um, you can expect that uh, there is a substantial mechanical stress affecting uh, the lower lumbar segments. And that is why our interpretation went rather in the direction of a mechanical problem with um, some reactive bone marrow edema, um, probably related to patient symptoms. How would you interpret this? So, so would you rather go for a mechanical issue or for inflammatory issue here, Kai? Yes, indeed, it is known that um, a, a stiff spine is prone to mechanical complications. You have to uh, to um, to see. A, a bamboo spine, which is which is behaving mechanically like a, a long bone, and if you have the bamboo spine and the sacral bone uh, and these two segments over here, the L4, L5, and the L5, S1, they are they are not fused. They have a normal nucleus pulposus. Then they have they have movement in these two segments, and they compensate for all the other segments that are not moving anymore. So it is very likely that these two segments are getting much more mechanical stress than uh, uh, on the regular basis. And therefore, I would go with your opinion that here we see a mechanical complication, although it's not like a fracture of, of some piece of bone. It's, it's like an erosive osteochondrosis that has developed here secondary to this axial spondylarthritis. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, um, that 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 was uh, our interpretation. So in in this case, we uh, decided against uh, escalation of anti-inflammatory treatment. Uh, recommended uh, recommended doing uh, exercise and uh, consequent uh, consequently um, 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 to take uh, NSAIDs. And after a few weeks, uh, there was a substantial improvement of patient symptoms. So in this case. Uh, imaging was quite important part of the diagnostic and differential diagnostic approach, which helped us to make the right um, therapeutic decision. So it is always worthwhile if you see a patient presenting to you with new symptoms or with a substantial change in the disease course to, to ask what is the reason for this and um, in doubtful cases uh, to perform imaging to see are there mechanical or inflammatory issues there. Thank you very much for watching and listening. Uh, stay tuned and we will uh, present next case in about four weeks. Thank you and bye-bye.